A warm welcome tonight to the first lecture of the 60th anniversary presidential lecture series on technology and the human future. And on this call, we have some students and faculty and staff, alumni, parents, members of the board. We decided actually to hold this series online uh, so that people in the AUP worldwide community could participate from anywhere. And as it happens, I am participating this morning at 8 a.m. in Los Angeles. And my friend Seth Farbman is at 5 p.m. the end of the day in Paris. And we imagine that all of you are, are somewhere in between. So I'm just gonna say a few framing words first about the series today, and then Seth will take the Zoom floor. And if you have any questions while he is speaking, please put them in the chat. I'll begin with the questions that are in the chat right after his talk. And then uh, Chiara Amor in my office is going to field little raised hands after we get through the questions in the chat. So the purpose of this series of lectures in AUP's 60th year, as we open an exciting new Master of Science in Human Rights and Data Science, is to create a platform for an important discussion about the rapidly expanding role of technology in human lives. And we want to consider at once, at the same time, both the many consequences of unregulated technology and the increasing potential to marshal technology for good. The academy, meaning universities, has long been interested in this set of questions, which are never simple black and white questions, never simply issues of good or bad, but always nuanced and always complex and interrelated. I believe that universities can and must be important players in this debate. How do we as scholars and teachers and students consider the ethical dimensions of and communicate the frameworks and policy recommendations to guide technologists and lawmakers. Some people, such as the French authors of a book called L'Homme Nu, Naked Man, are fairly pessimistic that the flood of information to which we're being submitted is simply going to irreversibly undermine our liberties and inexorably efface what was once thought of as private life. But others, uh, such as French mathematician and politician Cédric Villani, believe that we must and can yoke the technological revolution to the protection of human beings and our planet. So that, that might take into account the transformation of education, the preservation and enhancement of work, the expansion of diversity and inclusion, the protection of the environment, a renewed politics of public health, just to give a few examples. All of these scaffolded by ethical controls and good governance to improve our chances of attaining a better human future. So in this series, I've asked each of our speakers to consider both the theoretical analysis of the potentially dangerous impacts of technology on, our, on, human, on the human future and practices in which each of them has been engaged that direct technology's power toward achieving important human goals. So just to give you a few examples, to unleash creativity and disruption among tr traditional within traditional markets, and that's one of the things that Seth will speak about today, to engage data to diminish human rights abuses, and that's one of the aims of our, of our new Master of Science in in, uh, human, in human rights and data science, to drive activism and social change, which is the goal of our civic media lab at AUP, to reduce racial and gender violence and economic in inequality, and also most importantly, to strengthen our democracies. So it's a very great pleasure today to introduce Seth Farbman, former chief marketing officer of Spotify and current executive fellow at the Yale University School of Management. At Yale, Seth is working with other scholars and his students to connect a combination of behavioral sciences and psychology and sociology to first party data, the actions of customers and agents and audiences. He'll tell you to what end, I hope. That'll be one of the things perhaps that he covers. He's also senior advisor to high growth companies such as Peloton and Grubhub and Coinbase and Sunlink and Noom and the New York Times. He's a board member of Dashlane, one of my own favorite apps, and I believe he even ran Dashlane for a year as uh, CEO, J. Crew, and Snag, as well as lots of nonprofit work, notably with the Sundance Institute. Recently, Seth was named the world's most innovative CMO by Business Insider, and for the eighth year in a row, was ranked as one 
one of Forbes' most influential CMOs. He was also recognized by creativity as one of the 50 most creative people in the world, which seems like an incredible uh, laudation. He's also a trained journalist who worked for ABC and NBC and has been an, an adjunct faculty member at Yale, at NYU, at Ithaca College, and Virginia Commonwealth. I'm sure there is not a single student or frankly an adult in attendance on this call who doesn't have the Spotify app on their phones. Joining Spotify in 2015, Seth and his team took the company from the small Swedish startup that it was to a global company of 250 million subscribers in 65 countries. The the music world, the world's largest music streaming service. So I've asked him to describe that journey today to our students and all those in attendance um, cre and creativity in an era of big data is the title that he proposed. I've also asked him to lay out some of the ethical considerations behind the company's mission and business development. And I want to end with one little detail about Seth. He is deeply engaged with sustainability issues. And one of his many nonprofit projects that I'd like to leave you with was his mounting at the request of UN Secretary General uh, Ban Ki-moon, the largest ever pro bono consumer campaign to raise support for the UN's effort to secure a multilateral environment agreement between its member countries. So to the gathered AUP community, it's a pleasure to hand the mic to Seth Barbman, and don't forget to put your questions in the chat. Seth, over to you. Thank you, Celeste, very much. Uh, it's really terrific to be with all of you. Um, Celeste gave me a, a tour of AUP not too long ago, and I was quite impressed with all the public spaces, just really remarkable, creative, interesting public spaces. So I must admit, while uh, it's nice to be with you all in Zoom, my preference would be to be in person with you, uh, but maybe we can do that in the future. But um, uh, thank you so much. And, and, and I'll, I'll get to the presentation in just a moment, but it just occurred to me that actually we just gave our first example of technology and how it affects humans, human connection, is there good and bad? I don't know about you, but life on Zoom certainly takes some getting used to. And it's very interesting that, you know, when Celeste was talking, at least on my end, there was a little bit of a loss of signal and my lips may not be completely lined up with what I'm saying. And perhaps the, the lighting is imperfect and you can't really see my eyes. And all of these small nuances have an enormous impact on the way that we both give and receive information. And at the core of it, I find, I miss the human connection. I miss the energy back as a speaker or as an instructor. That's what I enjoy when you get to feel how what you said connected and maybe had some value. It's all about being selfish. And that is a very you know joyful, selfish thing to, to have. So, this is a really good way of thinking about technology as, as, as really affecting human condition, human behavior, human psychology in ways that perhaps we're not all that familiar with. So with that unplanned rant, I'm going to share a screen and we're gonna get into, um, into, the, into the meat of this. Um, let's see, okay. Now, I hope you can all see that. Yes? Someone nod, yes, thank you so much. That's the other thing, you need feedback and you don't get it as well. So as Celeste mentioned, uh, I call this, you know, creativity in the age of data, the era of data, a Spotify story. But Celeste also asked me if I would spend some time setting up this whole lecture series. I paused when she asked, but I thought, well, okay, Let's do that. And so what I plan to do is start with a bit of um, context, really. Technology and the human condition. What an enormous title. And technology, even for me, is I normally go to communications technology, digital technology, internet technology, but technology is, is far wider than that. So I imagine we're going to hear from people a very interesting arc in a whole lot of different industries. You're gonna to have to bear with me, however, because I am 
uh, likely going to over index on the things I know, which really is internet digital um, technologies. So I thought I would take you through a little bit of that and then just a little bit of context and where we are on this journey, right? Um, it feels like the internet is, is everywhere. It's not, but it soon will be. And I constantly am thinking to myself, we have a 16 year old son. He grew up on the internet. He doesn't know a world that does not have connectivity. And we are very close to a world where all of us who grew up before the internet are no longer here. And what does that mean when those who have perspective of a before and after, a past, a present, no longer create the future? It's a very interesting moment in our collective growth. And then what I love to talk about, of course, is um, my experience at Spotify. And I, I always try to make it fun because this is music, right? Yes, it's data. Yes, it's tech. Yes, there's been an enormous influence. Yes, there is good and there is bad, but ultimately I've had the privilege of bringing the most widely consumed art form in the world, music, to uh, you know, hundreds of, of millions of people. And it's uh, been a real uh, uh, a journey that I'll share just a little snippet of and maybe we can get more in number four, the Q and A. Okay. Now, I am having trouble advancing the slides. Oh, there we go. I figured it out. All right. Um, Celeste said it in her setup. It is uh, entirely unreasonable to come to a conclusion, is technology good or bad? It's entirely unreasonable. Why? Well, it's the obvious because the answer is always to most things in life, it depends. The way that I think about, um, well, I, I really love this, uh, this meme, this image, if you will, because the way I think about technology is an evolution, but I'm actually more interested in the evolution uh, of human beings. Because technology obviously is created by humans to put in service for other humans, but often we really don't know the effects of these things. You think about the light bulb. I think we could all agree, good or bad, if we had to do that uh, calculus, we'd say, oh, that's good, that's good. The impact of the light bulb on society is not just direct, but it's indirect. Of course, it changed the way that we work. It changed the way that we live. It changed the way that we no longer hunt whales. It's changed pretty much everything, but you could argue that nearly every technology that followed, followed off of the path of the light bulb. And you could assign incredible developments that go far beyond the direct impact of light all the way back to this massive change. There is no industrial revolution that leads to an information revolution without the light bulb, right? So we can agree, but that's when we're looking past. That's when we're looking back. That's when we have context, which we don't have. That's the hard thing about evolution. And that's why the title, humanity, human condition of the future is so important because the answer is we don't know. We absolutely, we don't know, but there are cues, there are lessons. And I'm just going to share a little bit uh, of those today. Okay, this is a book that's 20 years old. If you're in business, somebody gave it to you as a gift, probably when you made your first manager job at you know 28 years old or something. And, um, and if you haven't gotten to that point, uh, well, it's coming. So let me just tell you what this is about. It's a basically, it's a list of, of ways that companies become great. It's attitudes, it's behaviors. And one of the key ones, again, 20 years ago is around technology. Technology is an accelerator of momentum. It's not the creator of it. 
It's a very important distinction for me. There has to be creativity. There has to be an idea. There has to be a product or a service or a value proposition that technology then can accelerate. The acceleration of technology, and this started with Moore's law when you know we were talking about computer chips and the growth of the really the capacity for a chip to think. The acceleration of technology over these last 20 years is greater than the acceleration of evolution. We have not yet caught up to the technology we've created. So we are learning in real time what the effects are. We're learning the secondary effects. We're learning from the data. We're learning in a way that, um, quite honestly, we can't really predict. We can only experience. Now, when we look backwards at technology, and by the way, just to, if, you'll, if you'll permit me an aside, I was recently reading a study and it was, uh, it was about Instagram and Instagram's effects on psychology, uh, on brain chemistry, on behavior, and it could have been any social media, so take it for what it's worth. But what it found, what this study found was the action of sharing an experience on Instagram. For instance, I've just decided to take a trip. I am going to Paris. I've always wanted to come to Paris. I'm going to Paris. I'm finally doing it. I'm packing my bags. I'm going in three weeks. I've done it. When I share that on Instagram and when I get response, I'm so happy for you. That's great. I wish I could go. It's so great. Send me pictures. We experience a dopamine hit. We experience positive feedback. We experience joy, the pleasure areas of our brain fire. Three weeks later, we're packing our bags, we're getting to, ready to go. We don't have that same feeling. The pleasure centers of your brain no longer react as they did when you told people. So the experience now, is less valuable to you in creating joy and well being than the telling of the experience. What does that mean for human evolution? What does that mean for the future of humanity? The answer is I don't know, but I know it means something. Okay, sorry for that. So I think about the past and I start with, uh, with the printing press, with the Gutenberg press. And there's a very famous line by a very famous academic who is uh, sometimes also considered good and bad. Um, the medium is the message. The idea of this saying, the medium is the message, goes back to when television was first starting to proliferate. And the idea that a message on television with all of the senses, not all of the senses, but more of the senses being addressed with more reality and with this sense of symmetry. We are all seeing the same thing at once makes the medium itself more valuable. We trust the medium more. And trust is a very important thing for us to think about as we're having all of these conversations of tech. Because if you trust, then technology accelerates trust. If you do not, then it divides us. But what the printing press essentially did was it removed an obstacle, a massive obstacle of content creation and distribution. Before the Bible or whatever you wanted to produce was very labor intensive, very expensive, and therefore only a few institutions could do it like the church or the state. So all of the information came from one place. That created a sense of trust. The barrier was high, so therefore, if you're able to cross it, you must be capable. You must be thoughtful. You must be scholarly. The medium was the message. With the Gutenberg Press, suddenly, it lowered the barrier. 
and good friends of uh, France and a good American uh, named Ben Franklin from my hometown of Philadelphia, he saw the press in a very different way. It was all the news that was fit to print, although that wasn't his, that was the New York Times later, I think. But he saw it as a way to connect with people. And he created personas, poor Richards. He created different types of content for different audiences. And suddenly he was shaping culture in a much bigger way. The reduction in barriers, cost simplicity, creates greater diversity of content, creates better, faster distribution, but we lose something in the balance. We lose a sense of where the information is coming from. Now, while all the news that's fit to print is a wonderful thing, you cannot argue, well, sure, you can argue anything, but that the dissemination of information has lifted up the world. The more information is shared with more people, the decentralization is a good thing. But it also has created access to people in ways that were never done before, never available before. And there is always someone who sees the opportunity for propaganda. So the growth of propaganda and the uncertainty of the source of propaganda grows in direct relationship with the growth of a technology in communications, distribution, content creation, and less centralization and more decentralization. By the way, I, I don't speak German, so you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I believe that the concept of hope is applying to Hitler and Obama. So the way that we communicate, the way that we get people to think of themselves, are they part of a group? Are they against a thing? How do we tap in to their dreams, their hopes, and their fears? Because as a marketer, I can tell you that if you relieve fear and anxiety from a customer, they think of it as love. The reduction of fear is an important thing. Some things, regardless of technology, do not change. Okay, now I don't have to tell you about this. You know, the Gutenberg Press looked like nothing compared to whatever we're up to now, uh, 55, 60 years of the internet. When the internet was created, there was absolutely no understanding of what it would become. There was hope that it would be a force for good and there was belief that it would be ultimately the greatest collaboration tool uh, ever invented. And you can certainly um, argue that that has been true. But what we didn't see is that massive decentralization and an increase in what we call in tech features would essentially take very complex uh, content like photography and turn every single person into a near professional photographer. We didn't see how the connection of individuals would change the way that we think about ourselves, would change the way that we think about groups, and would change the way that ultimately uh, we would live our lives. For context, you are here. Now, I'm gonna go through the numbers at another slide, which I don't understand. Sometimes there are numbers that are so big, they become meaningless. But the way I think of this is that we are in the second inning of the technological revolution, of the connected digital revolution, the second inning. And the data suggests that that, that, that is true. By the numbers, last year, and I don't know if last year and this year will be the same, the pandemic has a big effect on our consumption, but 1.7 megabytes of data for every person, every second. 
I remember when I started out, you know, I was one of the early geeks who had the first Mac computer, 1.7 megabytes. I couldn't even imagine filling that up. Uh, the percentage of the GDP now that is being driven by technology, uh, I had to look up what a zettabyte, I think it's 18 zeros was. Um, but suffice it to say that the amount of data that we are all transmitting and that is affecting our decisions knowingly and unknowingly is it is not possible for us to really conceive of what that means. It is an enormous number, but more importantly, all of that data means that we're awash in data. We have almost unlimited access to information, but water, water everywhere, not a drop to drink. Our knowledge is not increasing at that same speed. And in fact, you could argue that our knowledge may even be going down because of the effects of algorithms, of bubbles, and of a feeling that you understand the whole world when you only understand a small part. We'll get to that in a moment. Now, and this is what we look at, you know, at Yale is insights. Insights are even harder to come by. Understanding this connection between the onslaught of data, the onslaught of information, the inability to really understand where it comes from and how valuable it is, makes it very difficult to provide an insight on what it is serving and what purpose in a person. And wisdom, I don't even think we're close to that. I know that I, uh, I do not um, admit to very much wisdom <laughs> in this space. Okay, now just for a little fun, data, data everywhere. Data can be applied to the consumer experience in ways that are quite magical and wonderful. Spotify, I'm gonna tell you about that. But in ways that are quite honestly foolish. Now, if you're from the US, you know CVS Pharmacy. When you go to CVS Pharmacy and you buy something, anything, their data backbone delivers at the point of sale a receipt that gives you opportunities to buy something else just like it. So the insights are brilliant, that's sarcasm. The knowledge <laughs> is just wonderful. I bought a toothbrush, would you like to buy toothpaste? Very basic and rather silly data. People understand this. People see when they're being delivered something of low value. And when you get receipts from CVS that are this long, of all the things that you ought to buy, there's really only one thing to do. Make a meme of it. This was a very popular Halloween costume a couple of years ago. The CVS receipt. And one of the most popular memes on the internet was this, and I didn't see the royal wedding, but I'm pretty sure that Meghan and Harry did not drag behind them a CBS receipt. But one of the pieces of, uh, of good that come from a connected technology is when you get it wrong, you know instantly. CBS hasn't quite figured out what to do with that information, but I just thank them for entertaining us. Now, I want to talk about a couple of um, other areas that perhaps are a little less glib. Uh, the first one I want to tackle is personal data. Um, we're in Europe. Europe has taken the lead, and California in the US, but has taken the lead in really protecting uh, personal data in prioritizing uh, personal data as even a right of the individual. Um, as Celeste had mentioned, I was the CEO in an interim basis and I'm on the board of Dashlane, a French company that is completely focused on your ability to own your own data, to share it when you wish and to retract it when you don't. 
I think of personal data as one of the major issues of our time. We have entered somewhat unknowingly, but willingly into what I think of as a social contract. We have told governments, we have told businesses, we have told each other that we will willingly share our personal data in exchange that it is used on your behalf. That social contract says that if I tell you about myself, you will give me better ads, you will give me better access to content, you will organize the internet in a way that's meaningful to me. You will have my best interest also at heart. We know that data also fuels others' interests, but personal data is at a very, very early stage. Um, the average person doesn't even know why it's important. And I think about, and it's interesting, Celeste, that you use that in your, uh, your opening, I think about this idea of is loss of personal data, the loss of um, really our core right to exist of life and of liberty and of the pursuit of happiness and of equality and of all of these very, very important democratic principles. And I think in the short term, the answer is yes. But then I wonder, and again, there's no wisdom, there's only questions, there are no answers. I then begin to wonder, are we at an in-between place? What would happen? What would happen if all of our personal data, all of our behaviors, all of our actions, all of our truths, all of the things we hide away about ourselves, for embarrassment, for lack of comfort, for being just um, not trusting to share who we really are. What if we move into a world where all of that disappears? Is it possible that that world is more transparent? Is it possible that what is replacing much of the narcissistic online behavior that we see today, the creation of your online person and personality and humanity, is it possible that that gets replaced with understanding and empathy? Is it possible that in a world where we live our lives out in the open, then there is less strife, less confusion, less of the other that is really driving our culture now. I have no idea. But these are the kinds of things that if you don't think about all the possible outcomes of a technology today, then as the old saying goes, when you don't know where you're going, any path will take you there. Another one is algorithms. I'm gonna come back to that in a moment because algorithms, can, they can be good or bad. Well, they cannot, it's just math, but they can point you towards good and bad in favor of a positive social contract or against it. And I wanna show you really a positive uh, example. But before that, when we get to that one, I just wanna spend a moment in the lower left, or sorry, the lower right here around facial recognition. Now, when we think about facial recognition today, at least what I think about is the brilliant experience I have when I go through an airport, I put my face in a frame on a kiosk and I sail through customs, sail through uh, immigration and border uh, control and have this frictionless experience. It is magical and technology's job is to deliver magic. When it is magical, we want more of it. We want to apply it to more places. 
It is really quite remarkable. Now, I know what you're thinking. <laughs> yeah, well, that means that every camera on every street corner suddenly is going to know where I'm going and when I went and did I eat the second dessert that I said I wasn't going to and all of these things, right? And that is absolutely right. But what I wanted to spend just a minute, maybe two minutes and 30 seconds, because I have a film uh, sharing with you, is uh, the work of an MIT Media Lab fellow who in her, she's part poet and she's part data scientist. And you'll see that in a moment. But the work that she started to do, understanding the quality of the data sets that come from facial recognition, almost immediately, as a woman of color, she realized that some of the great data sets out there from Amazon, Microsoft, IBM, um, Face Double Plus, which has, I think it still has the largest uh, database of Asian faces on the planet, Google. She found something very, very consistent. Didn't recognize her, didn't know who she was. And she started wearing a white mask and suddenly the computers knew who she was. So I wanna show you um, just a, a, a brief film of her work and how critical um, facial, rec facial recognition is to really getting equality and diversity right. And as I press play, I also want you to know that most of the people working on whether it recognizes a person accurately or not, look like me, white men. Biases accelerated through technology creates a hell of a problem. Here we go. Oh, here we don't go. smiles as I bask in their legacies, knowing their lives have altered many destinies. In her eyes, I see my mother's poise. In her face, I glimpse my auntie's grace. In this case of deja vu, a 19th century question comes into view. In a time when Sojourner Truth asked, ain't I a woman? question to new powers, making bets on artificial intelligence, hope towers. The Amazonians peek through windows blocking deep blues as faces increment scars. Old burns, new urns, collecting data chronicling our past, often forgetting to deal with gender, race, and class. Again, I ask, ain't I a woman? Face by face, the answers seem uncertain. Young and old, proud icons are dismissed. Can machines ever see my queens as I view them? Can machines ever see our grandmothers as we knew them? Ida B. Wells, data science pioneer, hanging back, stacking stats on the lynching of humanity, teaching truths hidden in data, each entry and omission, a person worthy of respect. Shirley Chisholm, unbought and unbossed, the first black congresswoman, but not the first to be misunderstood by machines well-versed in data-driven mistakes. Michelle Obama, unabashed and unafraid to wear her crown of history, yet her crown seems a mystery to systems unsure of her hair. A wig, a buffon, a toupee, maybe not. Are there no words for our braids and our locks? Does relaxed hair and sunny skin make Oprah the first lady? Even for her face well known, some algorithms fault her. Echoing sentiments that strong women are men. We laugh, celebrating the successes of our sisters with Serena smiles. No label is worthy of our beauty.
We asked Joy to come uh, maybe four years ago and speak to the most senior 75 people or so at Spotify. Uh, we loved the combination of her artistry, the intersection of art and technology. It certainly spoke to us, but it also really focused us on what problems we could solve or what problems at least we should be aware of uh, creating. Um, it was very powerful. Um, and I've seen that film and others of hers many times and I, I get chills each time and I hope you appreciated that as well. Um, what I wanna talk about quickly here and then we're just gonna get into the Spotify stuff because then I get to have a little bit of fun here is, not that this wasn't fun, but is this idea of the bubbles, the idea of the algorithm. And this is nothing new, we've heard about it. These are, you know, these are whatever, six of the six billion headlines written about this. We see what happens in presidential elections. We see what happens in every uh, part of, of culture and society. And the algorithm has been so successful at reducing us to our least common denominator. Has been successful at reducing us to our least common denominator. It takes an action and maybe it takes a second action and it decides in its best interest that that is how it's going to classify us. So it delivers us more and more and more. It's when you watch Netflix and you like The Crown, then all you get are British dramas. But maybe that's not why you liked The Crown. Maybe it's because you like period pieces. Maybe it's because you like character development. Maybe it's because you like a specific actor or actress. The data is only as good as it is tagged and applied to an algorithm. We started to have this thought and wondered what our role was at Spotify because we know what the alternative is. We can make smaller and smaller um, uh, bubbles where suddenly you be, have an echo chamber and then it hops over from the world of what we would say is conspiracy or crazy into mainstream. And so we thought this is a danger, but it's also an opportunity if we think of algorithms fundamentally different. Now, here's where I need to do just a minute, if you don't know the story, to tell you how Spotify actually became Spotify. And I like to think of this, how the, the record industry led to Spotify. Sometimes I think, oh, how they created, invented Spotify. It's really remarkable to watch a failing industry unable to change and unable to remember why it exists in the first place. If you go back now 15 years, the record industry was starting to collapse. There was um, quite a bit of piracy from a company called Napster and a guy named Sean Parker, who was also involved in Facebook, and he was early on, before he we went public on the Spotify board. And what had happened was peer to peer, people started to share music over services like LimeWire, like Napster. And suddenly the record companies had an enormous issue with loss of IP. And their artists were afraid that they would lose the ability then to earn a living. What the record industry did was decided to try to put the genie back in the bottle and it shut down Napster, it sued Napster, it sued others, it won quite a bit and there certainly was IP infringement, but it decided that it was going to put a stake in the ground that the internet and music did not mix. That somehow, it would be the one area that the internet would not democratize and open up. With that opportunity came Spotify. And Spotify was the invention of Daniel Ek who watched all of this happen. He was, is a musician and an engineer. And he thought, what if I created a legal, way to listen to music online. Would people pay for a legal way to do this and abandon the piracy 
and there was rampant piracy in Sweden. So it was a very sort of close to home thing for this young 22, 23 year old Swedish man. So Spotify was created out of an opportunity to somewhat decriminalize what had been a, you know, very, very popular action. 80 million people illegally downloaded music on Napster. 80 million people, that shows you how big it is. So at first Spotify was simply uh, a bunch of music and a search box. And Daniel went to the record companies and said, I wanna pay you for uh, licensing the music. They said, no, they said, no. They soon realized that they should hedge their bets because what was happening in the music industry is because of piracy, the labels weren't making as much money. So what they did is they started to shrink down the artists that they invested in, the music that they released on radio stations, on CDs, to the short things, to the hits. And all of these diverse genres started to shrink into rap and hip hop, country music, pop, rock, and that was about it. So the number of artists who could find a way to earn money started to go down. And the number of people who could discover their music went away. And that fundamentally is what the internet done, internet done well does. It is a discovery engine, not a recommendation engine. That's a distillation. That is a reductive exercise. Discovery is an expansive exercise. Now, what is required in order to create mass discovery of music, you have to start with the audience. So we very deliberately went out to get as many people on the service as possible knowing that no matter what algorithm we wrote, it would not be valuable to create discovery, discovery without a diverse audience of diverse music fans interested in all sorts of amazing music. That was the start of what is now called the freemium model and is copied by nearly every technology software company in the consumer space. We will give it to you free. We will give you some of the value, but we will incentivize you to pay. And if the tech is good enough, and if the discovery is good enough, then what we will create are tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions of people who are recommending to each other. It's no longer centralized. It's no longer what the record industry told you you should listen to. It's no longer what they wanted to promote. It's no longer just the artists they were feeling they would profit from. Instead, we knew everyone's listening habits. And if 40% of my listening habits line up with Celeste's listening habits, we decided that we would give Celeste something from the other 60% of my listening and vice versa. So let's not give Celeste what she's already told us she knows and likes. Let's find at mass scale people who share some interests, but promote the things they have not yet discovered. Now think about what that means. For me, it means that you get an audience of people who have open minds, people who enjoy sharing, people who enjoy learning, the same kind of people who like to travel, to learn new cultures, who like to experiment with new foods. That is 
essentially one of the most critical and joyful roles of art in the world. It creates context, it creates openness, and it creates a desire for more openness. So we decided we were going to be in the business of discovery. Now, the best way to demonstrate this was through an accidental idea that became enormous. In 2015, we called this the year of music and I'm hoping most of you are on the Spotify platform. And if so, you know that right around this time, the company delivers to you a dashboard, just a simple dashboard of your listening behaviors and habits. When we did it this first year, it was quite interesting because you, for the first time, had a mirror held up to your, to how you spent so much time. We would tell you how many artists you discovered. We would tell you how many hours you listened. We would tell you if you listened to more or less. We would tell you the number of genres you listened to. We would show you what music meant to you. Now, that's a very good marketing idea, but I had a question. What if we thought of year in music, not on only the individual level, which is useful, but what if we thought about it on the collective? What if we thought about a country? What would the country's citizens year in music would look like? What would, we th what would we think about sports fans? What would we think about people who love this? How many different ways could we categorize you? And instead of sending an individual message, send a communal one and show how music both reflects culture and can drive it. And so we went from something very simple like this to a a whole entire, I'll call it a campaign, but it is something that is not a marketing campaign that happens to you, it's a gift. It's a piece of happiness and joy that people receive uh, every single year. And we started to think about how we could dimensionalize the impact of music. So here's a series of out of home ads. Dear person in Venice who listened to Adele for four straight hours on Valentine's Day. You okay? Dear person who played Sorry 42 times on Valentine's Day. What did you do? By sharing the emotional uh, driver behind all of this data, not just the numbers, but what it means, it suddenly makes people realize how much joy and maybe how many bad things they might have done as well over the course of the year. Creativity from data. Dear person in Shoreditch, who stream it's the end of the world as we know it 11 times the day of Brexit, hang in there. You can actually see in the data how people's music behavior changes according to what is happening in the world, in their lives, and in the communities they care about. Dear person in South Williamsburg, which is outside of New York, uh, who played cold water six times on the hottest day of the year. We see what you did there. And proud to be uh, of Canada land. Canada land is uh, just a big podcast. Luckily, our US neighbors make it easy, right? The most streamed Canadian uh, podcast. And then sometimes it's simply humorous. Take a page from the 3,445 people who streamed the boozy brunch playlist on a Wednesday this year. That's somebody you want to be friends with. Or avoid the medical professionals who added these songs to their operating room playlists. Stressed out, can't feel my face, stairway to heaven, <laughs> say you won't let go. This is how data reinforces the positivity of art. Skip dinner invites from the people who added these songs to their cooking playlists. Slippery, all of me, DNA. You don't wanna be there. Now, 
A lot of people ask me, well, you took people's data because this is real data and aren't you overstepping a boundary? The interesting thing is when the data is true, when the data is real, and when the data is about something people are passionate about, they consider it a privilege to be included. Every single person was contacted. If we couldn't get in touch with them and ask for their permission, then we didn't run anything. We didn't use their, their playlists. It was always voluntary. And other than one political figure, no one ever said no to us, including the current Pope. And what is very interesting to me is that if you go into using data with the right intent, if you go into it with the intent of showing people and others their shared love for an art form, if you go into using your data to create not just a mass understanding of what is popular, but allowing people to discover things that are very personal, that they never would have found on their own. You give an artist an audience they never would have found, and you give fans access to content they could only dream of. And they respond almost always with joy and with a desire to do what most technologists want more than anything, more time, more engagement, more of a person's uh, attention and life. So this, uh, this actually was just from a week or so ago before Spotify wrapped uh, our release. And you all understand, we spent the last year in a severely altered mental state, didn't we all? And cannot be held responsible for my actions during that time. So we already are being preemptive <laughs> about our year in music. So we're gonna get on with questions. If you have some, I'm happy to share. Um, and I think maybe we're, how are we gonna do that, Celeste? People are gonna put those into the, into, the, into the chat, correct? Well, I think they did not actually put anything in the chat because like me, they were riveted on this incredibly passionate and visual as well as you know, auditory experience, Seth. So I'm not sure that anybody had a chance to write a question. So I think what we're gonna do is to simply take some questions from the floor. Maybe I'll begin with one because we've had so many conversations about this. I mean, obviously Spotify, I'm, I'm one of those people who derives great joy from Spotify and particularly lately listening to Adele's new album. So I, I'm, I'm right in there with the rest of your listeners. But I know that you had to face down also some really big ethical issues and you all had to huddle to think about how do we respond to this? You know, um, popular musicians who are caught up in all kinds of lawsuits and dilemmas. Maybe you'd like to talk about um, one or one of those or two of those and how you made the ethical decisions you made about that. Yes, uh, great question. And, um, you know, the view of Spotify from the very beginning was about diversity of, of content diversity of music, we got later into podcasts, some video, et cetera. But we really believed at our core, you know, to these sort of first principles that we talk about in, in tech quite a bit, we really believe that we should not be, um, that we should not be deciding what material gets on the platform and what doesn't, that we should be a place where any professional artist and we're very clear about that. We're not YouTube. We don't want, you know, we're not SoundCloud. We don't want sort of the, you know, the, um, uh, uh, the user generated content. This is professional. So if you had an agreement, if you had, you know, a record label behind you, we didn't want to play that role. But guess what? You don't always get those chances. So we had very strong first principles, but then, especially in reaction over the last few years to the Me Too movement, 
to uh, a new, more heightened awareness of diversity and inclusion, we were out of our element. So for instance, we carried on the service R. Kelly. We carried on the service Alex Jones and Infowars. And you can stand back and you can say, listen, US statement here, First Amendment rights, et cetera. We're not going to censor content, you know. But at the same time, you cannot really abdicate responsibility fully. So we had many, many conversations. Swedish company, if you know about you know, business in Sweden, you talk about everything forever. The two Americans on the executive team would be like, are we gonna get to a decision? Nope, that's not what this meeting is about. I learned so much. But what we talked about was where the edges were, how we were prepared or not to make these choices. And we finally said, we're, we're foolish if we try to do this on our own. So we started to explore and reach out to those who knew better, those who had dedicated themselves to understanding what is hate speech? Where do the edges of decency end? And so the you know, Southern Poverty Legal Council is a good example of a group in the US that we trusted. And we brought them in to help us and to educate us. But the truth is you have to take these step by step and you have to be aware that you do not understand the cultural nuances of every group. What, what a hip hop artist may say or do may, may not be um, clear to someone who doesn't really understand the black experience in America that it came out of. You cannot make cultural choices based on your own cultural experience. So we went wide and we brought in others in the tent and we continued to have all of these discussions. And what we found was over time, if we listened to what people told us both on the platform through the data and those who had dealt with some of these issues that we were going to make fewer mistakes. But perfection, not possible. An apology, we got good at that. Can I ask you, Seth, to please stop sharing your screen so we can see you bigger? And Thank you for that, yes. Let's see you bigger. And I'm gonna start with these two questions, which in some ways are, are the same question. Um, are good intentions enough? You know, how do we know uh, that uh, some of these huge tech companies that stretch across the entire world that have billions, if you think about, if you think about Facebook, um, you know, have good intentions. Or as a second uh, questioner put up here, science sans conscience, science without conscience, you know, is the ruin of the soul. Um, who should be making these decisions? Who can be trusted? I think there's this feeling amongst all of us that this is all bigger than we are. And it's moving so quickly. And such damage is being done, especially in, for example, the public health sphere or the political sphere. And so, how do we ensure good intentions? What are some of the sort of things that you put into play? You gave a great example just there of going to people whose business it is, the Southern Poverty Law people, whose business it is to make those kinds of distinctions. But um, as you look forward and sort of imagine the, the, the speed of things, how can we ensure? Yeah, good intentions are not enough, but if you don't start with good intentions, you are using technology to accelerate the unknown, the unthought through, and even worse, and I won't be very specific, but you actually will create a system that is almost predatory, that looks at its users for what value it can extract rather than what value it can create. So good intentions are not enough, but without them, we have a serious issue. And um, you know, the, 
the things that you put in place are, um, they're really like anti-hubris elements. What you measure in a company is what you put your energy behind. What you measure is, if what you measure is only time on site, uh, advertising revenue per click or per person, number of uh, customers, amount of revenue, that is what you will focus your, that's what you'll focus your efforts on. If you put into place and if you incentivize people, because companies are just a bunch of people, you point them in a direction, things like, I'm sure you're familiar with NPS, you know, it's about net present or net promotion. It essentially says, is this product serving an individual enough that they would recommend it to someone else? If you put measurements that are much more quality focused rather than quantity focused, we would look at the number of new artists that we were able to help. We would look at the number of artists whose income we were able to increase, not just by what they earned from streaming revenue, which by the way, the labels earn most of that money. Those are the contracts they made with the artists. The artists make money on tours, on concerts, on merchandising. If you say, how can I increase that? You start to look at the effects of your platform and the data that tells you, and you share that. So for instance, we created something called Spotify for artists that gave them access to the data. So they didn't just know how many fans, but they knew who were their super fans and who were the super fan or where were the super fans located? So they could create a tour that was in markets where their super fans would rush out and buy tickets quickly at full price. So the artists didn't feel like they had to discount out of fear of not filling the house or the stadium. We shared other artists so that they would know maybe who they should feature, collaborate with because of the shared fandom. And if you measure those things, it doesn't mean that you're always gonna get everything right, but it does orient the business towards different outcomes. And that's really key, but you have to want to do that. Thank you so much. And we have another question going back to that moment, Susan Perry, who is one of the directors of our new master's program in human rights and data science is asking about the prohibition on the use of facial recognition technology, except for the military present in the current EU draft legislation called the Artificial Intelligence Act. I think we were all kind of blown away by that uh, film, short film that you showed us about the biases inherent in facial recognition. So um, want to say something about sort of the EU's position on this and differences between American and EU positionings on? Yes, but I think I'll start simply by saying, um, you know, with a great deal of sort of, you know, self-awareness that people who create technologies should not be left on their own to determine the application of those technologies. And right now, government fairly broken, I think we can all agree, but still government, educational institutions are major institutions with the ability to guide right and wrong through laws, to provide unbiased research through the academic institutions are essential and need to get into the game. The EU has been better than the US, the US has been invisible. I think that's going to change, but regulation matters. And any decent technologist, the good ones are going to want that because we're not good at that. We don't think that far. Now, 
Generally speaking, I really think that the institutions like the EU reflect or should the desires of the people. So it is society, it is culture that determines what is acceptable and not. And we are uh, fortunate, I think, and I was sort of hesitating, the history of Europe is such that people understand what happens when we all go to our corners and believe that we are not connected with one another. So I think that naturally the EU is in a better position and is more progressive around things like facial recognition simply by reflecting on the history. Now, specifically on facial recognition, I cannot add to this. I can only add my interest, my concerns, and my belief that we are at a place where we are able to guide the use and the application, but we are never going to stop it. People who think you can stop a technology never really turn out to be right very long. Susan or Claudia, do you want to respond to that as specialists on the European arena? That's interesting. So Seth, thank you very much for this enlightening and wonderful conversation. More like a conversation really than a talk. It's great. Um, our students have just finished a midterm where they commented on the 80 page piece of regulation. And I think it was a difficult exercise for them. They did a great job. Um, we're concerned uh, that some of these technologies do not have built-in safeguards. And the European Union is probably responding to those technologies least likely to have those safeguards in place. Hopefully this will spur industry to build in those safeguards, privacy by design safeguards, other safeguards, so that at some point, some form of facial recognition technology would in fact be very useful to society. But at the moment, the way it's structured, it's not as safe as one would like it to be, particularly for children. And so consequently, our students were really curious about the way the language was constructed and what was permitted and what would not be permitted. Of course, this is still in draft form. It's going to go through several more um, uh, discussions, if you like, and probably pass sometime in late spring or early fall. Uh, but we're very committed to following this closely at the university because we're very curious as to how one can both use the technology and protect the most vulnerable members of society from technology that may in fact be harmful to them. So thank you for your comments. I think we see eye to eye. Well, I'm grateful that you and your students have done that. That is exactly what we need. And we need to make sure that all of our institutions are, uh, are focused on, on data, on privacy, on the guardrails for technology, and especially, as you mentioned, at this early age. Uh, we cannot allow um, a technology to find a market on its own. I think we all agree with that and loved you know, the fact that you felt that universities had a big role to play uh, in providing those kinds of recommendations. I want to hear why you think that the U.S., you said it's a, that the EU has done much better than the U.S., but things are about to change. What gives you that hope? Um, I really just think it's public outcry. I mean, I think people are just becoming aware of some of the negative effects now of unregulated technology. And I think that when you look at um, companies like Google and uh, Meta, formerly known as Facebook, that you understand that such an enormous part of the GDP is tied to these two companies. And so now you have a bit of shift uh, where you know, other businesses are starting to have something to say about a level of fairness and competitiveness. It's really started to accelerate over the pandemic. So I'm not, I'm not pinning all my hopes on government regulators. I'm pinning my hopes on citizens and businesses who are also citizens in saying, we need to steer this in a different direction and we need to start now. 
Wonderful. I have, uh, I did, I can't see hands. So I'm getting help from my office here who says that Claudia Rhoda, who is also an AUP professor and Susan's partner in the creation of this new masters has actually written in something in the chat here, which is, I remember reading on your LinkedIn profile that you achieved many of your goals by hiring really good people and helping them grow. That comes right out of great to good. And I followed that Bible too, Seth. So I, I agree with you. Could you tell us what you've been looking for in the people you've hired, what would make a graduate, particularly a graduate studying at the master's level, data science, really fit to contribute? Oh my God, I'm so happy I got this question. <laughs> this is one of the things I bang on about all the time. I'm a very big believer in social sciences. I think that one of the issues that we're facing, uh, or one of the reasons that we're facing so many issues now is because we haven't uh, really driven home how important psychology, anthropology, sociology, literature, art. I think that um, if we do not um, encourage and hire people who have spent time debating the unknown, people who are in seek of, who are seeking knowledge and insight and maybe a touch of wisdom instead of just the information. If we don't, then we are not going to have innovation. We are not going to learn from the past. What I look for very simply is original thought. When I talk to the MBA students at Yale, I say, you just learned how to run a business. You learned it from somebody else. Now start to focus on original thought. What is your thought, your idea, your actions, your wishes, and your beliefs? That's what I look for. Curiosity, an interest in culture, an interest in something other than the job, and someone who has the bravery to express an idea and to maybe even fight a little bit for it. That's what I look for. And when you get those people, they feed off of each other. And then as a manager, as an executive, you just get to sit back and watch and have just a really remarkable uh, sense of joy from seeing them grow. The job of the business executive is to create an environment for others to prosper. That's it. So does that mean that you look for students who've been educated in the liberal arts context, as well as students who have technical experience? A absolutely. I mean, when somebody comes in really with, um, uh, re with, a, with a degree or an experience that's job training for a specific job, I'm not as interested. Look, my, my career is a bit wandering, right? Like, why did I create a company in sustainability that did this thing with the UN? And people are always like, you are a journalist? Well, how did you become this? And the reason why, and sometimes we do, we have to be careful about this, look for people who have had similar experiences. It's, it's just a level of curiosity. It's, it's, it's wanting to know more than one thing. And it's being driven by the intersection of multiple things, because that's where something special happens, not just in our digital data, but in our interactions that we have with people in real life, IRL kids, day in and day out. Well, I'm gonna just ask everybody if there's anybody else who wants to ask a question, Claudia maybe, who wants to follow up on the one she just asked. Christina has a question. I just, I just want to say thank you for that answer. <laughs> I was hoping to hear. Exactly. <laughs> and, and I think we really recognize our education and what we're trying to do with our students. And so, yes, thank you. <laughs> do any of the students want to ask a question? I think Christina de la Boucher had a question. Zeta, zettabytes, cloud storage, sounds enormous and enormously polluting. Can technology be AI be sustainable and environmentally accountable or responsible? Well, it should be, but we're gonna need a real step change. Um, I've been very encouraged um, 
of late, IBM has made some progress in fundamentally changing the way the computing is done. Because what we're doing now, we're just building, you know, layer over layer over layer on top of very old technology by this point. So now, you know, the, the computing is finally creating that real step change. We have to innovate ourselves out of this problem. You know, you can't, some things you can scale your way out of a problem, but this one we have to innovate and we have to completely rethink um, the energy consumption, the way that, um, that chips work. Like it is, it's from the, you know, it's Henry Ford time. It's from the horse to the car. And that's the only way we're gonna get out of what is an incredibly resource demanding uh, future otherwise. Yeah. I'm going to uh, read a student Agreed question, I think, first here about Spotify. Seeing the growth of Spotify in the last couple of years, do you think the company will ever open itself to submissions from musicians, contributors, unsigned to labels? Speaking from the perspective of an artist who had to submit music through sister services such as DistroKid, I'm a bit worried about where my money goes as I submit my work indirectly. Yeah. It's a, it's a very, it's a big question. It's a good one. Um, the answer is, I think so. Uh, we looked very hard at SoundCloud for just that reason and wondered if we should, um, you know, honestly just <laughs> acquire SoundCloud. But we thought that they were doing uh, a good job and we don't have to do every job. So I think the answer is likely, but I want to be, you know, super clear. Both the culture and nature of the company and of the business model, we're in this position where we have uh, committed to the record labels to make sure that there is a role for them in the future. So we don't want to get into a highly competitive uh, environment where we're taking over everything they do. Because what the labels do pretty well is a and r And for those of you who don't know, they're the ones that are sending somebody out to the dive bar to find the, you know, the next great artist. Um, that's not in our DNA as much. Uh, so, but I do think we will see Spotify move more and more in that direction for sure. And a couple, we're gonna end now because we're five minutes before the end, but we're gonna end with a couple of philosophical questions from Gergi Stojanov, who's a specialist on AI and uh, a very inspiring professor at AUP. Um, I, I think I'm gonna give you your choice here because there are three in the, three very good questions in the, in the chat. One is about that question you talked about, that issue you talked about, about Instagram and the dopamine hit. Yeah. Um, in your view, what might be the qualitative difference from the pre-Insta times you were telling this to your friends in person? Could it be the volume of reactions? The second one is about the dramatic increase of available information. Um, one consequence was that people now spend more time jumping from one content place to another and less in-depth engagement. Hence, we all have less and less in common, sort of shared in common, which leads to the fact that we're all being reduced to the least common denominator. Um, an epiphenomenon was that nowadays, say in context of TV series, the humor becomes possible only by using absurdly superficial cultural and other references. So are we moving toward the shallower than, rather than the deeper notion of connection? And finally, you mentioned the danger of losing freedom or something along those lines. How about the danger of having the illusion of autonomy? So I'll let you pick one of those three more philosophical questions to respond to, and then we'll thank you very warmly for this talk. Well, well because all three or four of those questions deserve you know, hours of debate, I'll simply say this. I'll go back to something I said earlier. I, I believe we're in a transition stage. I believe that we have not yet figured out what to do with this powerful technology, and I believe that evolution has not caught up with technological revolution. So what I believe is that right now we're essentially using powerful tools to create cat memes and to create uh, feedback loops that we don't get in our real life. I think that we're using the veneer 
of friendship and connection instead of um, really establishing much harder actual. But I think that I place my trust in humanity. And if I look at the long tail of humanity, it is not a straight line. It is two steps forward, one step back, and will always be. But I think as, I forget the name of the reverend who said this, but I do believe that the, the arc of humanity does bend ever so slightly towards justice towards goodness. I just think we're in a very, very pivotal, pivotal stage, but I'm gonna trust humanity. Well, on that note, thank you for your humanity, Seth, and for your warmth, for the wealth of examples that you've given us today and for launching us really into what I hope will be a year long conversation about this. Thanks to all the students who participated and who, uh, you know, who are here today. Thanks to board members. We've got lots of board members and faculty members as well. And, um, you know, really, it's nice to think of one of these big technology companies having been in hands like yours, really. It's very kind. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye.